a strange tower watches over the Nile Valley. Located 80 kilometers south of Cairo, it is quite far from the most famous pyramids. This is the Pyramid of Meidum, and yet it doesn't look at all like the most common pyramids such as Khufu and Khafre. Instead, its shape is reminiscent of a keep, like an impregnable fortress. Even the locals call it Haram el kadab the false pyramid. Actually, someone called him yesterday. He was passing by, and he said, this is not a pyramid. It looks like a tower. The peculiar shape of this monument has continuously bewildered archaeologists. Is Maidam truly a pyramid, a funeral monument, or, as its shape suggests, a temple dedicated to Ra, the god of the sun? From what we know today about solar temples, they used to look like big obelisks. So the shape was rather similar to what Maidum currently looks like. An obelisk a spike soaring to the sky and reminding of a sunray. Vassil Dabrev, a French archaeologist, is convinced that Maidam is indeed a solar temple. We can feel here that we're building something that will look like an obelisk. And what's an obelisk? A petrified sunray. Well, that's what we would have here, too. Talk, talk. Besides, he thinks there's another element that questions the true nature of Maidam. The room some consider to be the burial chamber. Even though today, sand partly covers the sides of the building, its sole entrance is located very high on the north side. Once inside, there's a staircase called a descending passage that leads to what is supposed to be the burial chamber. The entrance to the descending passage is located 30 meters high. For the first king, Snefru, it's 12 meters. Khufu is about 15 meters. Khafre is right under the tiles under the yard. And Menkori is two, three meters. We never see mummies that must be brought more than 30 meters above ground. When looking at it like that, this narrow room doesn't seem ready to receive the pharaoh's mummy. If there had been a sarcophagus, it would have been here. How come the king, during all the years of his reign, didn't find the time to level the floor in order to make space for a sarcophagus? It means that there was no plan to put a sarcophagus here. It would barely take two days to fix this. No sarcophagus has ever been found in this room. But perhaps even stranger, no pharaoh seems related to this building, meaning that Maidam is not a pyramid. So what could it be? It's a temple. What temple? Who was the god at the time? It was Ra. The whole civilization honored this god. So there's nothing more normal than building a temple for this god. An obelisk shape, an unfinished chamber for the king. These clues seriously question the nature of Maidum. In order to find out its true identity, archaeologists such as the American Mark Lehner who spent his life studying pyramids, had nothing but the location itself to carry out their investigation. You know, this kind of archaeological work is like detective work, like a crime scene. You see bloody gloves. You see tracks going across the floor. The window is broken. It's the same kind of thing. There's no texts that tell us in a narrative way what happened. So you have to infer from all this kind of evidence. The challenge was huge. The events happened 5,000 years ago, and most evidence has been washed away by time. Yet archaeologists do have a trump card, science and new technologies that allow for a totally different approach. Unlike their predecessors, they now have access to drones, satellite images, and extremely realistic 3D models that permit a very detailed study of the site. This is particularly true for photogrammetry. For the first time ever, this groundbreaking technology will create a geometrically accurate digital copy of the building. It will then be used to analyze the structure of the pyramids. 
we have a real 3D view, not realistic, real. It means we have access to the monument as it is. It's not a reconstruction. Such photogrammetry gives us a 3D view, but also the right texture. We have the color. In order to reach such an incredible level of detail, a drone and several cameras are needed. They must collect thousands of images over the whole site. We'd like to fly about five meters away from the walls in order to create a 3D model that is accurate up to one millimeter. Then we'll combine the model with the pictures shot from the ground and link all of the sides together. The challenge lies in scanning every inch of this massive site. We're going to use different angles. Otherwise, we won't get the flat areas. The drone will give us access to the upper levels that we can't see from the ground. It will be really helpful for the scientists because they have a hard time accessing these levels. But now they'll be able to inspect the whole surface digitally, just as if they were on the building. More than 10,000 digital pictures will be treated and properly positioned so as to accurately represent the monument. My first impression is that you can actually visit the site without being there, which is very useful, to a certain resolution, to a certain degree of detail. You know, the devil, as we say, is in the details, but so is insight into how they did it. Every piece of that 3D image has a unique position in relation to others, and so we're able to measure the monument and its characteristics accurately. Thanks to photogrammetry and the endless possibilities it opens up, Archaeologists hope to be able to validate their hypothesis regarding this mysterious monument. The technology has led to a first discovery. Madam is indeed a pyramid and not a tower. A view from above gave that hint to the archaeologists. By studying the 3D model, they were able to clearly identify the base of the monument, although it's partly buried. From the ground, it's almost impossible to see that base. Photogrammetry also lets them accurately measure each side. The base is square, about 144 meters on each side, meaning an impressive total surface of more than 20,000 square meters. Excavations on the north face of Madam unveiled the outside cladding of the pyramid. The base that surrounds the keep indicates a smooth-sided pyramid, a real pyramid. And when looking at the excavated area, that shell is clearly visible. This is what we call fine Tora limestone. And they use it, they select it on purpose for the casing, for outer casing. Thanks to photogrammetry, it's easy to determine the gradient of the outer shell and to calculate its angle, 52 degrees which is evidence that Madam is a pyramid. Indeed, archaeologists are familiar with this number. The most famous pyramid in Egypt, Khufu, also has a slope of 52 degrees. This is the perfect angle, the one that has guaranteed the stability of the structures through the centuries. The pyramid is currently 70 meters high but by looking at its base and the angle of the casing, which were both accurately measured thanks to the 3D model, archaeologists estimate that the building used to be more than 93 meters high during its golden years. There are many clues telling us that the pyramid was much higher before. It was in a much better state during antiquity. Greek tourists have left markings at the top of the building, which simply means that during their time, the top was easily accessible, so it must have been in a better shape than it is today. This proves that Madam used to look like all other pyramids, and still look so during antiquity. But photogrammetry has yet another surprise for archaeologists, a big one. When on the site itself, from the ground or even from the first floor, we can't see anything but flat ground everywhere. But when looking at the 3D model, a linear structure appears, too linear to be natural. In fact, what you see here um, is something that I was looking for when we were at Medum, and I couldn't see it. Maybe I saw it just vague, faintly. Now here in the point cloud, it's coming out, this very large 
dark band, you know, as a square around the pyramid, an, an outer enclosure. The photogrammetry clearly shows us what's left of the outer wall, but it's completely covered by sand. However, given how massive the sand piles are, we can imagine that the wall is still in a relatively good shape, or at least part of it is. The outer wall was invisible up until now, and it proves that Maidam wasn't isolated. Just as with all other pyramids, it was part of a very codified complex. During the excavations that took place in the beginning of the 80s, archaeologists dug more than 15 meters along the east side of the pyramid. This massive work uncovered a small funeral temple along with a huge 220 meter long path. This path typically connects the small temple close to the pyramid to the temple in the valley. A closer look at the model shows the general shape of another element that can't be seen in the field because it is completely covered by sand. Another pyramid, located in the southwest of Maidam. We have a small funeral temple, a small pyramid, a path that connects the temples, and so on. This is a classic pyramid complex of the fourth dynasty. There can no longer be any doubt about it. Maidam is a true pyramid. Despite its peculiar shape, it follows all the rules of a traditional funeral complex as they were built during the fourth Egyptian dynasty. But Maidam's shape isn't the only thing that has been confusing experts. Indeed, the pyramid isn't claimed by any pharaoh, which seems incredible. When coming inside the small temple located to the east of the pyramid, Mark Lehner is confused. Something vital is missing from these huge slabs, a marking that can be found in every other pyramid, the name of the pharaoh who built it. Completely blank stila. They just left it unfinished. The place was destined to receive the presents for the pharaoh, and everything seems ready. They even prepared this offering slab in their traditional shape of a stylized mat with a loaf of bread, very worn and broken. But the offering slab was prepared, the stela were here, smoothed down, ready to receive an inscription. They were left blank. I mean, for the ancient Egyptians, this is unthinkable. You have to have your image and your name inscribed to live on in the afterlife. So if there's no signature, how can the pyramid be connected to any pharaoh? The funeral complex, the outer wall, the big and the small pyramid, the small temple and the long path tell us that this is a pyramid from the fourth dynasty, meaning sometime between 2543 and 2436 BC. But how can we find out which one of the seven pharaohs of the fourth dynasty is the father of Maidam? We think we know these kings because we say their names so often. We associate their names with the pyramids. But you know, we couldn't write a narrative history of this period. We just don't have the text. We know almost nothing about these kings. In order to find out the father of this pyramid, we need to know when it was built. The date can be established by studying the burial chambers inside the pyramid. Indeed, their position has changed dramatically through time. The first burial chambers were dug directly in the ground and were accessed through a shaft. Then, little by little, Egyptians became bolder and they started digging chambers inside the pyramid's body itself. The pyramid, this massive artificial mountain, it was, was built to protect the mummy of the king. The irony would be if the very weight and pressure of the pyramid imploded the chamber and crushed the mummy of the king. And here again, photogrammetry will play a crucial role in studying the inside of the monument. Cameras are used to photograph every angle of the long corridor heading down to two small rooms and the king's chamber. The analysis of the 3D model afterwards confirms what archaeologists suspected. The king's resting place is located inside the building itself, at the very bottom. This is a key difference compared with the first pyramid of humanity, the one Pharaoh Djoser built. If we compare Maidum to the pyramids that came before it, from the third dynasty, for example, the stepped pyramid of Djoser, we can see that for Djoser, the rooms were placed underground, whereas in Maidum, they are built inside the pyramid's body. 
In the Djoser pyramid, the tombstone is placed at the bottom of a pit, 22 meters underground. 100 years later, the burial chambers inside Khufu are placed in the center of the building, much higher than in Maidom. This first discovery means Maidom was built between the Djoser pyramid and Khufu, sometime between 2600 and 2500 BC. This is a major step forward as the location of the burial chamber excludes Khufu and the following five pharaohs. Only Snefru, Khufu's father, is left from the fourth dynasty. Could this pharaoh be behind the construction of Maidom? The few clues the archaeologists gathered in the field tend to confirm this hypothesis. Egyptians during the following centuries and millennium have always considered this pyramid to be Snefru's work. Although the pyramid was never officially signed, peculiar markings that caught the experts' attention were found in the corridor of the small temple. The name of Snefru was found in the temple, Snefru rising. And this is why that description that written in the New Kingdom it is in the mind of the people all the time that Srefro is the builder of this pyramid. The graffiti made by travelers from antiquity date back to the 18th dynasty, some 1,200 years after Snefru's reign. Exactly, there's a fairly long graffiti up here. It's a very short one. Uh, the graffiti mentioned Snefru as though this were a place of Snefru. It just adds to the probability that Snefru was the owner of the Medum pyramid. This king is quite known already. Archaeologists think he was behind the construction of two major buildings, the Bent Pyramid and the Red Pyramid in Dashur, about 40 kilometers away from Maidom. Yet if Maidom indeed belongs to Snefru, why isn't there any trace of his sarcophagus? And why would he have built three pyramids? Careful analysis of the burial chamber will help the experts uncover a possible use of the Pyramid of Maidom. When you dig an empty space inside a building, you have to make sure that every stone piled up above it doesn't lean too much and come crashing down. They're worried about the weight and the pressure of the pyramid basically imploding the chamber, destroying it. To prevent such a catastrophe, Egyptians have come up with a groundbreaking technique. So instead of beams crossing horizontally, they do the corbeling, where they bring every course in a little bit more, a few inches more, until the, the room closes at the top. And this is a way to roof a space. The first archaeologist who visited the burial chamber recognized the use of a common building technique during the Middle Ages when building cathedrals. It's called corbelling and consists in placing the stone blocks in tiers. The idea is quite simple. It's about letting most of the weight of a block rest on another block and to leave only the last quarter hanging, which has no risk of falling down. The main advantage is that this can take on heavy loads thanks to the way the weight is spread. Yet one element of the architecture confuses archaeologists. The ceiling of the two small rooms that lie at the bottom of the corridor don't use corbelling, although they should, being placed as they are inside the pyramid's body, just like the burial chamber. What was strange was that these two small rooms had a flat ceiling, which couldn't possibly stand the pressure from above. It means there had to be something above them to protect them. Archaeologists from the 19th century had already noticed such flat ceilings inside the burial chamber of Snefru's son, Khufu. After some digging, they discovered the technique the Egyptians had used so that this kind of ceiling could withstand the massive pressure of the pyramid. We know that above Khufu chamber, there is five relieving chambers, that the ancient Egyptian made them to load the heavity of the stones. These small, hidden rooms located above the king's chamber have the same function as corbelling, spreading the huge pressure of the pyramid. 
Could such relieving chambers have been used in Maidom II several decades earlier? In 1999, a French team started investigating to discover the answer with the obligation of not damaging the pyramid. They tried to see behind the walls by using a tiny camera. It was quite simple, really. We used an endoscope, just like a medical endoscope. We just needed to drill a hole about 1.5 centimeters wide, then insert an optic fiber in it, and then look. The team settles above the small rooms inside the burial chamber. They manage to insert the endoscope through a hole in the mortar, but the operation turns out to be more complicated than expected. The main issue was that we couldn't see much, because the endoscope is very small, and we couldn't send much light inside the rooms. After several trials, what they hope to find is here. In the end, though, we managed to see that the relieving chambers we suspected existed were indeed there. So what are these chambers anyway? Well, there are vaults built with the corbeling technique, hidden vaults. The flat ceiling is actually a false ceiling, and above it lie vaults built in corbelling, just as in the burial chamber, that protect the two rooms. Madam, Sneferu's first pyramid, is a testing ground. As we can see, with the entrance located too high up to easily allow the mummy to be brought inside. The whole history of pyramid architecture through the reign of Sneferu is really getting better and better at enclosing larger and larger spaces. They were getting bolder and bolder. After building a four cubits wide room that didn't collapse, in the next pyramid, they thought, perhaps I can make it five cubits. And it didn't collapse either. And so inside the next pyramid, they said, let's make it six cubit. And that's how sizes have increased. Photogrammetry will highlight another key element in this investigation. Measuring the width of the king's chamber inside Sneferu's various pyramids can help determine in which order they were built. In Maidom, the burial chamber is 2.51 meters wide. In the Red Pyramid, it's 4.18 meters. And in the Bent Pyramid, 5.13 meters. Therefore, Maidom has the smallest burial chamber of the three, which would mean that it was the first of Sneferu's pyramids. Something archaeologists have noticed in the field. You can really see the, the advances in corbeling, just in terms of the beauty of the masonry, how smooth it is, the regularity of the steps as the sides close on each other. You really see the advances in the Bent Pyramid, and then you see near perfection in the Red Pyramid, the North Pyramid at Ashur. But at Maidum, it's the very beginning. The superior chamber in medium is really ugly. It doesn't have the noble characteristics, the proper polish a burial chamber should have. There are almost no vertical walls. It's like a vault dropped directly onto the ground. Lots of mending and defects, too. Since this is the beginning, they want the chamber to be small, too. They're not confident to have a huge space that they have to roof. Both the measurements and the quality of the work point to a similar conclusion. The Orphan Pyramid Matum is indeed Sneferu's first pyramid. Sneferu is the only pharaoh who built not one, but three pyramids. Beyond the reasons that led him to build several tombs, archaeologists think that the sheer fact that a single pharaoh could build three pyramids proves one thing the tremendous power of Sneferu and his kingdom 4,500 years ago. The economy reached its peak, and the idea of kingship was that strong. The king had a very strong power to control the country, to make the country building his pyramid. Sneferu benefited from a strong economy and an unusually long lifespan that allowed him to carry out his ambitious projects. This king whose name means es Nefuru, he who perfects, has reigned for 42 years, perhaps even 50 years, we don't know. We imagine he must have been very powerful, we imagine he must have been healthy, and he must have been very ambitious. His excessive ambition led him to show impressive organizational skills in order to make his massive building sites work. In 
Indeed, Snefru's logistics were incredibly effective and spread much beyond his kingdom. To build the pyramids, he had to import the most beautiful limestone blocks from the distant quarries of Aswan and Tora. He even went all the way to Nubia, in the south of the country, to bring back slaves that would help the local workers. The wood used for transport comes from Lebanon, and the copper used in making the tools needed to build the pyramids come from the distant mines of the Sinai Peninsula. In 2011, in Wadi El Jaf, on the shores of the Red Sea, one of the major bases used in building Matum was discovered. This is the most important archaeological discovery of the beginning of the 21st century, a discovery that no archaeologist dared to imagine. And with it, an incredible level of logistics is revealed for the first time. Here we are in the oldest port in the history. The technology allowed us to locate this port. Such a discovery was made possible thanks to Archaeology 2.0. During the 50s, two French pilots flying over the coast had located archaeological remains. Pierre Tellet, an Egyptologist who has long been interested in harbors and ports in ancient Egypt, sought to find this location. A satellite image helped him. By looking carefully at the satellite shots, he was able to find the remains the pilots had mentioned. He notices a strange L-shape underwater that looks like an old harbor, and the analysis of the local underwater geography confirms his idea. The location of this old harbor matches that of a kind of inlet in the coral reef that runs along the coast in the area. They had located a place where accessing the shore was easier. Moreover, another element will strengthen Pierre Tallet's theory. This site is clearly accessible through a natural corridor called Wadi Araba. And when we follow this corridor to its end, we find out that the place where it connects to the Nile Valley is also the location of Medum. And so it's obvious for us that the very location of the Wadi Jarf is directly related to the pyramid. These clues are good enough to justify the start of a massive archaeological excavation campaign. And the results go well beyond anyone's expectations. Archaeologists are able to uncover a massive harbor complex. Mohammed Abdel Maguid is an Egyptian expert in underwater archaeology, and he thinks we've just discovered the very first artificial harbor in the history of mankind. So this harbor is made with two artificial piers in L shapes. They thought at this very early period in the history to construct a pier to close for the current and the wind. Then the ships can be safe inside. The harbor must have been very busy indeed, as its size suggests, 200 meters long and 200 meters wide. So this area could take maybe 15 boats. Every day there is a boat who is leaving, another boat who is coming. You have to charge cargo and discharge all of this needs workers. The excavations unveiled many buildings near the shores, and six kilometers away, there were 14 warehouses dug directly in the mountain. Inside and around, many boat-related items were found, such as these first anchors, heavy stones roughly sculpted. Some even present traces of the ropes used 4,500 years ago. Many remains help to conclude with certainty that this was all Snefru's work. In several locations, we were able to find items with the name of the king. Among the galleries and storage space built in the harbor, we found the seal of Snefru on the lid of a jar that must have been used to keep products brought to the harbor. This logistics center is essential to build the Pyramid of Matum. Just in front of us, on the other side of the Gulf of Suez, you will, uh, you will hit directly on Sinai. By boat, 
the harbor is only 50 kilometers away from Abu Zenima, very close to the copper mines, the material used to make the tools needed in building Sneferu's pyramids. It's very likely that the very conditions behind the building of the harbor, probably right from the beginning of Sneferu's reign, match the rising need in copper used when building colossal structures. The harbor of Wadi El Jaf establishes a direct link between Maidam and the material needed to build it. But more important than the time gained, this guaranteed a more regular and a safer supply compared with the old road that went around the Gulf of Suez. When building things as massive as pyramids, work must obviously be very well organized and structured. Thanks to such an important discovery, archaeologists have a better understanding of the logistics Snefru had set up to build his three pyramids, something no other pharaoh after him will ever match. But one question continues to trouble archaeologists. Why did Snefru build three pyramids when one would have been enough to grant him eternal life? Maidam gives us part of the answer. The king liked to experiment and to continuously improve building techniques until he found the perfect pyramid. During the 80s, the excavations on the north side of the pyramid uncovered the building's structure. This was a chance for researchers, who could now study the structure of the pyramid and carry out photogrammetric analysis. The results are striking because this is exactly what we can see in the field, but on a computer instead. The analysis of the 3D models unveils strange anomalies namely the fact that perfectly carved limestones are visible under the layer of rough stones. The American archaeologist Mark Lehner thinks these blocks tell us the incredible story of Maidam, that of two pyramids built into one. Well, right here you can see the corner, the beautiful Torah casing, and the beautiful corner of one step of the old step pyramid. And so these blocks would be what's left of the outside of an older pyramid, hidden under the smooth sides of Maidam, a staircase-like pyramid, also called stepped pyramid. On this view, shot with a drone, what looked like the floors of a keep would actually be the leftovers of the initial staircase shape. The pyramid of Maidum looked like a stepped pyramid at first, and it was completed as such. But at some point during the king's reign, the stepped pyramid was turned into a smooth-sided pyramid. And so all around this stepped pyramid, they added a kind of casing that would make the whole structure look like a true pyramid. Calculating the angles of the upper floors gives a result of 70 degrees. That's the slope of the old-fashioned step pyramid of each step, and the accretions they use to make the steps, they slope at about 74 to 75 degrees. Under its smooth casing, it looked just like the first and only step pyramid ever built, that of Pharaoh Djoser, who built it 100 years before Maidum. To the Maidum pyramid, it's really two pyramids in one. First, there was this old step pyramid, an old-fashioned step pyramid that Snefru started. And this is the first time anybody really completed a pyramid to this height since the first pyramid of Djoser. Other kings tried to build step pyramids but didn't complete them. If the place hadn't been in ruins, we wouldn't have known about the stepped pyramid inside. We wouldn't have known the monument's history. And a closer study of the building tells the same story. Two techniques belonging to two different time periods were used to build the pyramid of Maidam. Thanks to photogrammetry, for the first time we are able to see every element used in the building process located on top of the monument. We can see all the masonry, the construction technique based on stones, angled towards the center, towards the core. The technique consists in placing the stones with a 15 degree inclination toward the inside of the building. The advantage of this is that every block leans against the central core, and all forces are sent to the inside of the monument, without the risk of blocks moving towards the outside and causing a collapse. The technique was invented by Djoser to build his stepped pyramid. 
This is really a method from the third dynasty. The other method used is visible on what's left of the smooth-sided pyramid at the foot of the current structure. Egyptians used to lay stones horizontally. Then they would carve them to give them the final smooth appearance. This technique has only been mastered during the fourth dynasty. So how can we explain that Egyptians used two building techniques coming from two different eras? And why didn't the pharaoh stop at the stepped pyramid? That for some reason he had another idea. And apparently it was this idea for the first perfect pyramid with, with straight sloping sides. For that he went to Dashur. Dashur is located about 50 kilometers north of Matum. Snefro moves the court there and starts building the very first smooth-sided pyramid in history. So there's evidence that he began with a very steep pyramid of 60 degrees. Remember, at this time, nobody knew what a good pyramid should look like. And the evidence is that he was having problems, structural problems. But quickly, cracks appear all over the building and the pyramid threatens to collapse. Snefru launches a plan to save the monument as he understands that a 60 degree angle is too steep. He surrounds the monument with masonry and finishes the top of the pyramid with a 43 degree angle. You have to understand that was the beginning. The Arctic made a mistake, challenging with a big angle, and therefore they did learn. Snefru has learned his lesson. Still seeking the perfect pyramid, he starts building a third one, but this time with a much lower angle. And apparently his builders were confident. He went north to Dashur to build the Red Pyramid at the low angle of 43 degrees. And this is a success. The pyramid is still stable 4,500 years later. It really looks to me like there was a conscious research and development program to achieve this perfection. The same research process is used inside the building. Once the corbelling technique that consists in roofing a room by laying stones in tiers is mastered, Snefru takes more and more risks and places the king's room ever higher inside the monument. But as a perfectionist, he doesn't stop at the smooth-sided 43-degree pyramid in Dashur. Instead, he goes back to Matum to turn the step pyramid into a perfect pyramid. Now, all of this is part of the story of Meidum, because evidently, Snefru sent his builders back to Meidum to enlarge the step pyramid and make it a true pyramid with sides that slope at 52 degrees. That's the classic pyramid angle. The fact Snefru went back to Meidum after the pyramids in Dashur is backed by observations in the field. The pyramid's casing is the proof that Maidum was the last pyramid built. You can see where they're coming in with a chisel, and they're being very careful at that seam between one stone and another. You see the vertical chisel marks coming down like that? At Dashur, you can see where again and again and again, they were breaking the edges of the casing stones and having to patch them. They would square off the break, and then put in a patch. Now they've they're learned to be really careful when they dress the stone down to those edges. Studying the structure of the monument tells us an incredible story. That of a work that spread over four decades, the full length of the Pharaoh's reign, making Matum his first and last pyramid. Snefru started at Meidum and finished at Meidum at the beginning of his reign and at the end of his reign, it tells a story that makes sense. This is the story of a transformation from a stepped pyramid to a perfect pyramid. But how could Matum go from a perfect pyramid to a mere keep? So much so indeed that a confused archeologist about its true nature, and the locals call it ironically, Haram el kadab the False Pyramid. After 2,000 years dominating the valley, could the pyramid truly have collapsed? The idea of collapse is made compelling 
It's an attractive idea when you look at how irregular is this later masonry against the very smooth Torah limestone casing of the original step pyramid. And there's no good squared joinery between these filling blocks. And they come up in a very loose, irregular way against the very smooth old step pyramid face. So there's nothing there to lock the two phases together. And that's why we could think possibly of a slipping away of this later masonry and a catastrophic <laughs> collapse. And so the very story of Matum and its double nature would be its downfall. This is a tragic fate indeed. From being the first perfect pyramid of the fourth dynasty, it went on to be a quarry for the following generations. Many camels used to come and hold the stones, taking stones from the pyramid to build uh, major structures in the Islamic Cairo. Now disfigured, Maidam doesn't have much left from its old splendor. The pyramid with such an incredible story is now buried under the sand and forsaken by men. Archaeology 2.0 has solved the mystery of the true nature of Maidam and helped trace back the story of an amazing project. The Maidum Pyramid is really two pyramids in one. In fact, the Maidum Pyramid is the beginning and the end of the story of how to design a giant pyramid. Yet some things remain unexplained. Why didn't Snefru write his name on the slabs in the small temple? He could have claimed to be the father of such an architectural wonder. And why has the burial chamber not been completed? The very place supposed to protect his dead body. These questions remain unanswered for now. What troubles researchers is that the tomb of the pharaoh who built three pyramids has yet to be found. And all they have are hypotheses about this. It seems that Maidum could have been some kind of alternative in case of an early death. When Snafru started the massive projects in Dashur, he wasn't certain he'd see them completed. Being old, it was much easier to complete Meidum than to complete a pyramid that was only starting in Dashur. Some Egyptologists believe that the pyramid isn't signed because Meidum was never a tomb. This pyramid never been used for the king. This pyramid, in my opinion, it became like a dummy pyramid. It's a sacred object and it becomes like what we call a cenotaph. It's a memorial to him rather than his actual tomb. Other researchers believe that the real burial chamber is yet to be found. This so-called burial chamber feels more like an open space to move things. Even more so when we consider some strange elements, such as the wooden blocks that seem to have been used to handle things. They're located in front of the north wall, which also presents unusual characteristics. It isn't built like the other walls. Behind this wall may lie the king's tomb. Maidam was built far away from the most famous pyramids such as Khufu, but remains one of the most mysterious. This monument and its peculiar shape will demand several more decades of archaeological investigation. But thanks to new technologies, researchers hope to soon be able to decipher the last secrets of this monument built 4,500 years ago.